Um, and yes, as Andrew pointed out, uh, I'm from California, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. When people from other states learn that I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, they immediately start apologizing. <laughs> like, oh man, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, I get it, you know, I know things, things are crazy there. We try to do our best to evangelize. I work in San Francisco, uh, especially during this time of the year, uh, things get pretty wild. Um, but even us in the San Francisco Bay Area, when we hear about what goes on in Oregon, uh, we look at what happens in Portland and we're like, man, <laughs> we feel sorry for some of you guys sometimes. <laughs> Uh, you know, because it gets really wild. And, um, you know, so it just makes me really grateful for a small town like Glendale, uh, because I think there's, there's a lot of wisdom uh, in some of the values that uh, are, again, perpetuated here in this town. And, um, yeah, my prayers are for you all, that you all will uh, continue to, yeah, follow God, and hopefully you don't have to join at all to do that. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, thank you, Brother Andrew, for reading today's passage. Today's passage is from Galatians 5. Uh, Galatians 5, is, as Brother Andrew talked about, is, is where Paul addresses this topic of Christian freedom and Christian liberty. Uh, in context, he's responding right, to the issue of some Jewish Christians both practicing and teaching that you have to be circumcised in order to enter into heaven. You know, Paul is essentially saying, no, as Christians, you are free. You're completely, you're totally free. Uh, and, and this topic, this passage was laid on my heart uh, for today because as we're approaching, you know, the 4th of July and everything like that, I think that the, the conversation of freedom is top of mind in our culture today. Uh, but what I want us to, what I want to point out to us is that I believe what Paul has in mind when he uses the term free and freedom is likely very different than what the average person in our generation our contemporary society has in mind when they use that idea. And I believe that this serves as an obstacle. We hear the term freedom that Christ sets us free, and because we have this cultural idea of what freedom is, I feel like this serves as an obstacle to us understanding what freedom in Christ really means, what true freedom really means. Uh, and, and this is important because we live in a society that values uh, uh, individual freedom. And so if you don't really know what it means, uh, you don't really know what you're trying to accomplish or where you're going. And so we need to understand this. Uh, we, we, there's a lot of cultural ideas, thoughts and ideas that, that, that are circulating, and it's important for us as Christians to be, be able to vet these ideas and to understand them from a biblical perspective. And this is important, number one, for ourselves, so that we can examine ourselves to see if we are truly free, we've been set free, and also so that we can compassionately uh, communicate and, and talk and interact with other people who only knows the world's, the culture's definition of freedom. And so, uh, the first thing I want to point out is that I believe that there are at least two sides to freedom uh, that we see uh, in the Bible. And that this differs from how the culture defines freedom. Uh, so how does the culture define freedom? Before we get into that, I would like us to maybe do like a quick mental exercise and ask ourselves, uh, what do we think about when we think about the concept of freedom as it pertains to our lives, our context, individually? So uh, what, what do I think about when I think about Sam being free? And I Andrew being free, what does that mean uh, in my context when I think about, what does it mean for you when you think about you being free? You know, what do you, what do you, what do you, pic what do you picture? What words come to mind? See, I believe that the, the cultural definition of freedom uh, that we see being perpetuated today is that of absolute freedom. The absolute freedom of the individuals, or better, better known as like no restraints, no limitations at all. This is, this is what the culture means when it teaches freedom. We see examples of this expressed in various different areas of life. We see uh, Andrew and I were just talking about you know, this, the, the, the movement of, the, of sexual freedom that kind of started in the 60s and the 70s that kind of led to what we're seeing now with the, the throwing off of restraints when it comes to sexuality uh, and, and, and promiscuity is what's leading to also uh, home, uh, this rise of homosexual behavior, transgenderism, uh, and of course we're, we're deep into Pride Month at this time where this is being celebrated, this idea of sexual freedom, that you cannot put limits on how uh, I express or how one expresses 
their sexuality. You know, we see abortion, people wanting to have, to feel like they uh, deserve and, and should have the freedom to kill their unborn child, their unborn kids at any time. And of course, here in the state of Oregon, uh, you know, unfortunately, the uh, state government has, uh, has legalized a lot of uh, drugs and, and, and crimes, um, you know, and you know, for the sake of personal freedom and personal gain. And uh, I think this this idea of absolute freedom again runs in in opposition to this idea of freedom that we get from Scripture. In doing a quick survey of Scripture. I believe that there are two main aspects of freedom that we should all understand, especially as believers, <laughs> that we should all understand. Uh, and I believe that these kind of serve as kind of like a practical definition of freedom uh, that we can kind of use. Uh, so, I, you know, to, to say plainly or to say it in one particular way, I believe that to be free means to, to have access, to have free access to what is good while being protected from what is bad. Amen. So number one, to have free access to what is good. But number two is while being protected from what is bad. That, I believe that second aspect of being protected, being restricted, uh, having restricted access to what is bad or being protected from what is bad is important and is an aspect, is an important aspect of freedom that we don't realize is actually always there in the background. And we see this in, our, in, in all throughout Galatians 5 and all throughout scripture. Galatians 5 verse 1 that our brother Andrew read, it says, For freedom, Christ set us free. Stand firm, and then, and do, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. And so using the world's definition of freedom, this might seem kind of odd, because it's saying God sets you free. But then it goes on to say, then do not do this thing. And because the world's definition of freedom is no limits, you know, it's it's... Is this thought of, you know, how can we be free? How can you put a limitation on me and then say that I am free? You know, it, notice how this runs in contradiction to that idea of freedom in our culture. Our culture teaches that the moment you tell me not to do anything, you've just encroached on my freedom and that you are wrong for doing so. But that's hypocritical. It's hypocritical because there are so many examples in our world today where we realize that a big part of freedom is, is restricting that which is bad. You know, for example, uh, you know, it, it was about a six hour drive, three hours to Reading, and about three hours here uh, that I took on the I-5 uh, to get here today. Um, and all throughout the I-5, you know, sometimes the road can get very, very narrow, and sometimes it can turn to a bridge, you know, you never know what it's gonna do. Uh, and there's moments where, you know, there's no uh, shoulder and, you know, and, or you're on a bridge, what you do have on the side of the, of the roads are guardrails, which I'm really happy that they do. <laughs> and I'm sure most, most of us are really, really happy that are there. Because you know that, you know, if something happens, the wind is too strong, or you maybe fall asleep, and if you veer off, you have guardrails to protect you from going over. Amen? Mm -hmm. And that's typically the good thing. You, we do not complain about guardrails. We don't, we don't complain about um, our ability to access no land being restricted, <laughs> right? Because we know that that's a bad outcome that we are actually trying to avoid. In fact, we are actually happy with the guardrails. And with the guardrails there, we feel free to move faster <laughs> to get to our destination on time. But you take those same barriers, those same guardrails, and, and you use them to block the driveway to your favorite restaurant, and all of a sudden they become a problem, right? And it's not the guardrails themselves that's the problem. It's what they're blocking access to that becomes the problem. If they're blocking access to something that we want, then that becomes the problem. But if they're blocking access to a negative outcome, we're fine with that. Not only are we fine with that, but we actually want that, amen? And growing up, we used to have a power generator not too far from my house uh, that was uh, uh, protected by a, a, a gate with barbed wire. And so that way the kids can play around without you know, going near the generator and touching it because that outcome would not be a good outcome. And in fact, if the barrier wasn't there, the parents would complain. You know, people, our kids cannot play freely in this area because it's not safe, right? Uh, and it's, it's, it's also the same 
deal when you talk about, you know, you know, take imagine a small town like Glendale here. If there were a handful of bad actors uh, who, was, who were making this town unsafe for the kids, it's quite often in our societies, we, we lock up individuals that have a, a predisposition toward violence. Why? So that the rest of us can live freely. So that we can go about freely. So it's, it's quite obvious to us that yes, that freedom is having access to what is good, but it's also restricting what is bad. And both of those things are very, very important. Both of those things lead to true freedom. Uh, and so, and, and so this, and this idea again, I believe, is reflected throughout the Bible, even in the opening chapters. In Genesis chapter two, Verse 16 to 17, it says, And the Lord commanded the man, he said, You are free to eat. Amen. You're free to eat from any tree in the garden. So that's the good. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of, of good and evil, of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. And that's the bad. They had free access to everything in the garden, but just not that. That not just not that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, Christ says later on in John 14 that if you love me, you will obey my command. So while Adam and Eve were obeying this command and not eating from this tree, they were demonstrating their love for God. So there are two main things I hope we take away from the sermon. Uh, again, the first is this idea of freedom that I think speaks to our culture. Uh, and I, I think uh, Timothy Keller, the late Timothy Keller, articulated uh, this the best. Many people have articulated an idea similar to this, but I think uh, Timothy Keller really summed it up very well. Uh, Timothy Keller said that freedom is not the absence of restriction, but the presence of the right restrictions. Amen? <clears throat> freedom is not the absence of restrictions, but the presence of the right restrictions. And so that's the first idea of two that I... I, I really hope that uh, we walk away with the sermon, uh, walk away from the sermon with. Uh, a friend of mine who's a, a social worker and a Christian believer, and she's a secular social worker, a few years ago we talked and she mentioned how it's tough in her line of work because she's also a counselor uh, and it's, it's, it's hard for her as a believer because they cannot use terms such as right and wrong when talking uh, to uh, you know, their, their patients, the people that they have uh, in front of them. And uh, like legally, they, in practice, you can't use these terms uh, as, as a secular counselor because they, they carry uh, a religious significance. It's like, how do you define what's right and wrong? And, you, and you, we know as believers, you can't, it can't be up to the individual, as some people will say, that right and wrong is defined at the individual level, right? I, I had a, a Encounter one time when we went out for evangelism with uh, one of our neighbors, and um, she was arguing this point, a atheist, and uh, uh, she was she was talking about how she 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 wants to fight to end uh, child sex trafficking of, of young girls, and which I, which is good, which is a good thing. Um, but when we got to the idea of morality and right and wrong, and um, uh, I, I asked her by what on what basis are you saying this the child sex trafficking or the rape of these young women? is wrong. And we continued to talk about it, and she realized that she couldn't define it on the individual level, which is what she said initially. And now I'm pointing out, well, for the person who's committed the act, they're not seeing it as wrong, well, and they're an individual. Uh, and, and, she, and unfortunately, she conceded to say that, I guess, that she guesses that she can't really define it as wrong in her work view. At, at best, she can say that it's not beneficial. And we continue to talk, and that's, that's a scary thing. That's a scary thought that people are so against God that they're willing to abandon these, these sure, these true categories of right and wrong just for the purpose of not submitting to God. It's a scary thing, and it has terrible outcomes, a lot of which we are seeing in our society today. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, again in, in, in Galatians 5, it says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh 
they are in conflict with one another so that you do not do whatever you want. So that you do not do whatever you want. Uh, Ilu uh, Kipchoge is a Kenyan, Kenyan runner. He's the first man to uh, run a marathon in under two hours. Um, and he, you know, he has this quote that you know is, is a, on a lot of his apparel, and it's 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 uh, a quote. It's a simple quote. It's, Discipline is freedom, is what he says. Discipline is freedom, and his whole idea is that you know you have to discipline yourself. You don't want to get up early in the morning to go run. You don't want to you don't want to eat healthy, but you have to discipline yourself. You have to not uh, give in to your some of your own desires so that you can live a better life. This idea that discipline is freedom. I think he's communicating that same idea that you have to restrict certain bad aspects of your life so that what so that you can enjoy the good, so that you can better enjoy the good. The, this idea of true freedom, in that sense. Uh, but what I like about this quote is that I believe it agrees with Scripture in pointing out the fact that sometimes the bad that needs to be restricted in order for us to enjoy our freedom isn't some criminal, right? Isn't the isn't always the government trying to encroach on the church or something like that. But oftentimes, and more often than not, the bad that needs to be restricted is inside of us. It's inside of you. It's inside of me. The bad that needs to be restricted is in all of us. And the Bible calls this our sinful nature, our tendency towards anger, our tendency towards impatience, our tendency towards lazy, laziness. You know, Galatians, again, Paul continuing in Galatians 5, uh, starting from verse 19, uh, he, he talks about how in Galatians 5, he says, Now the works of the flesh, this is our sinful nature, the works of the flesh are obvious, <clears throat> sexual morality, uh, uh, in moral impurity, promiscuity, promiscuity, uh, idolatry, sorcery, hate, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, corrosive, and anything similar. So he's not giving us an exhaustive list. He's just saying, hey, these are examples of your sinful nature that needs to be restricted. These are examples of the, of the bad things that are keeping you from enjoying true freedom, from enjoying the good. He says, I'm warning you about these things, as I've warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he goes on in verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. So we see this contrast between the law of God, the commands of God that are good and that leads to life, and our base desires. Um, many neuroscientists, uh, is, this is uh, common knowledge now, nowadays in, in, in that field that um, they, they found out, you know, in the last 10 or 12 years that um, those diagnosed with, with clinical uh, psychopathy, right, so, so clinical psychopaths, so people who, who they don't feel empathy, you know, they have a hard time empathizing with, what, with sorrow, with pain, and so, so oftentimes, more often than not, uh, people who commit these mass murders, uh, these uh, these terrible crimes, are often diagnosed with clinical psychopathy. Uh, and what they found out was that um, there's usually an issue, either genetically or through some means, uh, with their prefrontal cortex, essentially. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that helps them, regulates their emotions, that, that uh, helps them empathize with other people, right? And so uh, because this part of the brain that's supposed to help them regulate their emotions is malfunctioning, they have a hard time feeling. They have a hard time feeling sorry. They have a hard time feeling bad or remorse. And I think that's that's an important, an important idea for us to understand as believers uh, because I think what this shows is that uh, this, this issue of psychopathy, it's not adding more evil to the character of the person. It's simply restricting or diminishing their ability to control that evil. And so for, for those of us who aren't clinically psychopaths, as far as I know, <laughs> aren't clinical psychopaths, uh, we should not feel in any way 
superior. Because what that shows is that even for us, that that te- that ability is is in us as well. The the, uh, the the possibility for us to do these horrible things are are within each of us. Yes, we have our prefrontal pro- our cortex functioning uh, to a degree that helps us empathize, but it's there. And if 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 uh, we didn't have that that ability to filter it out, it would come out. That evil would come out. In all of us, it's it's our sinful nature. Uh, uh, Paul talks about this in the book of Romans, chapter seven. He says in Romans chapter seven, even as a believer, he says, "So I discover this law: when I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law, but I see a different law." in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, with with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, both my flesh, the law of sin. So you have to understand that within each of us is this tendency, within every human being, growing up, uh, is, is this tendency to uh, to rebel, is this tendency to um, make ourselves our own gods, to follow our own desires, you know, uh, to, 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 we're inclined towards the sins that Paul lists out in Galatians chapter 5, it's, it's our sinful nature. And so the second most important idea that I hope you walk away from the sermon with is that only Christ provides true freedom. Amen? Mm -hmm. Only Christ provides true freedom. It it is possible to discipline yourself in the flesh um, and to kind of reduce uh, the outward expression of our sinful nature. Sure. But only Christ provides true freedom. He provides free freedom in the truest and deepest sense. Why? Because if freedom is number one, access, free access to what is good, then through Christ, we have free access to the highest good, which is God himself. You know, John chapter 14, verse six, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life that nobody comes to the Father except through me. In 1 Peter chapter three, verse 18, uh, Peter writing of Christ says for Christ suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous why it says to bring you to God that's why Christ came to bring you to God you know in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah it talks about how God's hand is not too short to save nor is he his hand too weak it says but your sins are uh, are separating you from your God it is our sins that separate us from the goodness of God but Peter is pointing out the fact that Christ died, Christ's mission and Christ's purpose on this earth was to bring us to God. Because God wants to be connected to you. He's a father, he's waiting while, while you're trying to figure him out, while you're trying to try to understand all these nuances about God. He's just there, present, waiting to be in relationship with you. And that's why Christ died, to bring you to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen? Amen. There is freedom. Christ is, again, the truest, uh, uh, grants freedom in the truest and deepest sense, because if freedom is also the restriction of what is bad, Christ restricts the source of all badness in this world which is our sinful nature itself which is our sinful nature so often people blame God for all the disasters that we see on this earth and, and I, I empathize with, with that heartache with that pain that you, that you uh, get when you, when you do see these terrible things happening but what we have to understand is that the word of God does not put the blame of, of the brokenness of this earth on God, it puts it on us that that we are the ones. So often we blame God for all these things that we're doing. But but, but but what are you doing to be a solution? What are you doing to address the issue? And the Word of God says, the Word of God 
points out and makes it very clear that it is it is our fault that sin has entered the world. You know, it is our fault that the world is broken, not God's. And God, not because he needed to, not because he was deserving, but because he was righteous, because he's loving, cleans up our mess. He resolves our problems. Galatians chapter 5, again, in our, in, our, in our target passage, it says, in verse 24, it says, Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Amen? The source of our, sinful, our, of our sinfulness. All these different crimes, these injustices that we might see here and there, they, they, are, they are as a result of men and groups of men following after their sinful desires. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 56 to 57, it says, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Amen? He, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that does he give us the victory when we come to him in, in faith. Uh, even at, during in our walk, uh, when we do sin, when we do fall short, the word of God says we can come before him um, and, and ask him for grace, ask him for forgiveness. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says, if we say we have no sin, John talking to believers, he says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, in verse 9, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So while it is possible to discipline yourself, only Christ grants us the victory and the assurance and the true victory over our sinful nature. And another way to say that, only Christ provides us true freedom so that we can enjoy the highest good, which is being connected to God. Amen? And that's a message that we must understand. And that's a message that we must take to the world. Because there are so many, and maybe some of us here, there are so many who are enslaved to sin, and do not know it. You know, um, in, in John chapter 8, you know, uh, the Israelites were uh, discussing with Jesus and they were, they were uh, kind of like opposing some of what he was saying and, you know, and saying that, you know, we, we are not slaves. We've never been slaves to anybody. Um, you know, you know why would you use that terminology? And Jesus uh, talks to them and he responds to them in verse 34. It says, Jesus responded, truly I tell you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but the son does. So if the son sets you free, you, will, you really will be free. Amen? Amen. Michael knows of, of the Daily Rock Wire, recently interviewed you know, uh, a couple um, and, uh, who both husband and wife uh, you know, claim to have come out of the homosexual and transgender lifestyle um, after having an encounter with Christ and um, the wife, I remember watching parts of the interview and the wife had mentioned that um, that she was unfortunately raped at a young age, at like seven or, or five or seven years old um, by a teenager and she kept it to herself and that this broke something in her psyche in which she be, began from that young age to then have that trauma uh, then led to um, the way she began to express herself sexually as a young teenager, uh, and then led to her eventually going down the path of changing her gender. Um, and, uh, and she also had, uh, talked about how she eventually, in her young adult years, as she, she tried to uh, explain it to her mom, and she finally got to the point where she tried to uh, confess what happened to her mom many, many years ago when she was a younger kid, that her mom uh, responded with a very cold um, response, saying something to the effect of like, well, now she understands why she's such a weirdo or something like that, was how her mom responded. And, uh, and that devastated her. You know, part of trauma is not just going through something bad, but it's the understanding that it's, it's kind of weird. Part of trauma is not just going through something bad, but it's the understanding that the world continues because it feels like the world isn't seen when you're going through your bad situation, and that that psychologically makes our bad situation work worse. Uh, and so, like trauma is, is really kind of weird in that respect. In that respect, um, 
but it's it was it, but it was because of this that she went deep into this lifestyle of of sexual absolute freedom when it comes to uh, sexuality um, and unfortunately statistically that that seems to be the case with uh, many many people I'm not saying everybody but statistically that seems to be the majority of the cases um, when it comes to folks engaging in that lifestyle that there does seem to be a sense of childhood trauma that has never been addressed or has never been resolved that's why that's why as Christian men and women we have to protect our kids amen we have to protect our kids it's super important to, to build a safe environment for our kids to grow up in um, but you know what a lot of people are unaware of and are unconscious of is that you know they're really crying out for help to a, a particular degree um, not realizing that the path that they're on they're on it because they are essentially enslaved to that past trauma. You know, whether it be sexual trauma or trauma with your parents, uh, growing up maybe abusive or neglectful parents. Um, you know, psychologically that, that makes it harder for you as a husband, if you're a man, or as a father as well. And, uh, and, and honestly, it, you know, what, what, what people end up doing unconsciously is, is really kind of drawing attention to themselves, an attempt to kind of show people just how messed up they are. An attempt to try to show people how broken they are. And, and that, that manifests itself in a lot of these uh, behaviors that, that we consider um, um, unhelpful, maybe suicidal tendencies. And it's really because these past traumas have not been resolved. They're still enslaved to these past traumas. And um, oftentimes it's exacerbated because it's not just that they're running into a particular direction, uh, in a particular direction because they're running away from something, but then it's also compounded with the fact that it, you might use, you know, drugs, and there's there's this, uh, this you know, this increased level of dopamine that you get with these with these drugs and, and with the sexual prom promiscuity, and so it's not just running away from something, but it's running towards an improper expression of something that might be considered good. Uh, and so it's 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 uh, it truly is a snare, uh, and unfortunately, and oftentimes it's not just one thing; it's it's multiple things. It might be you know neglectful parents plus sexual trauma plus all these different things plus the added addiction for drugs or the addiction towards sex, and and all these things are operational in the life of a lot of people. And we must have compassion. You know, the book of Luke, chapter four, Christ opens up the scroll of Isaiah, and he begins to read in verse 18. In verse 18 of Luke chapter 4, it says, Christ says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, amen? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And in verse 20, it says that he wrote up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began, and he began by saying to them, today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. You know, uh, Jesus says in verse, in John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled or fearful. These are God's promises. In Matthew chapter 11, he says, uh, come to me, verse 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for, for your souls. Amen. It's so sad to see how much our society needs God and are reaching for the benefits of God without reaching to God himself. And it's important that we trust God. We take God at his word and we trust him. And you may ask, you know, how can I trust God when there are so many questions I have? There are so many doubts that I have. There are so many questions that are yet to be answered. And one can say in response or one can ask in response, how could you trust God without those unanswered questions? 
because the, the, the precondition for trust is to not know certain things. If you had all the answers, which is physically impossible for us to do, but if you knew everything, then you wouldn't need to trust God. But I, I believe that, uh, as, the, as the Bible says, and that, as the Bible points out in Romans 1, that, that there is sufficient, there's more than enough evidence for the reality and for the existence of God. And the Word of God says in Romans 1 that existence itself, creation itself, is constantly screaming out about the reality of God. You know, to the point where it says that mankind are without excuse. That we are without excuse. And so the hard part isn't um, whether or not there's good reason to trust God. The hard part is trusting God. Is choosing to trust God and not yourself. It's choosing to bow your knee to God. It's choosing to submit. And when it comes to that, you know, of course, of course, of course, there will be commands of God that we might take issue with. There will be, there will be commands of God that we might agree with. And why? It's, it's because we're not all good. You know, we're not all knowing. But God is. So I would expect there to be commands of God that don't make sense to me because I'm not all knowing. I would expect there to be commands of God that seem weird to me because I'm not all good, but I trust that God is all good. I trust that he's the good shepherd. And I trust that it is better for him to be master and lord of my life than it is for any other human being. And that it is for myself. That it is for myself to be master and lord of my own life. Because I know my flaws. But it is a good thing for a good God to have total power and to have total control. So trust is nature. You know, he says that I'm not a man that I should lie, nor a human being that I should change my mind. In Psalm 73, verse 28, he says, uh, but uh, Asaph writes, Asaph, the writer of Psalm 73, he writes, he says, but as for me, God's presence is my good. Amen? I've made the Lord my refuge so I can tell about all you do. And again, in Galatians 5, verse 13, it says, you, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another in love. And um, the most loving thing you can do to another person is, re is lead them down the path where they can be reconnected to the highest good, which is God. Through the only way that they, they can be reconnected, through Jesus Christ, who died for them, so that their sins will not count against them when God sees them. That's the only way we can change people. And that's the only way we can change this world. And so, you know, we don't get too caught up in fighting the physical battles, whether or not you guys want to join at all or, or some people might. The, the whole point is, you know, uh, governments are like uh, gas prices. They rise and they fall. But the whole point is, through it all, we as Christians have one mission and one purpose, and that is to be about the spreading of the kingdom of God. The salvation of individuals, one person at a time. And with that, and through that method, we can change our society. We can change our culture for good. We can, we can fight the good fight of faith. Amen. As believers in the Almighty God, we don't we don't need a majority in the society to uh, bring about change. You know, we don't need uh, a ton of money or riches to bring about change. We don't need the influence of some sort of famous celebrity or politician to bring about change. We need faith. Faith. You know, I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God to salvation. We need faith in an almighty God. And so as you're here today, if you feel like there are um, certain sinful desires and tendencies or trauma uh, your past that you might feel like you are enslaved to to, to any degree. Uh, it, it may seem like it's impossible. Man, <laughs> yeah, I do a lot of homeless outreach and, and work with some uh, uh, homeless ministries, and I can't tell you how many times I've seen people, and I'm, I'm with people now, who believe that their situation is completely hopeless, completely impossible, that they're not worthy of God's forgiveness or even of God's grace. And I've seen people who have taken 
a step of faith, you know, believing that God is true to his word, where he says that, uh, where Paul says that to, to Timothy, that uh, I, I was the chief of sinners, but God saved me to show me as a pattern toward anybody who will come to faith in him. You know, and, uh, and I've seen them change. In the craziest of situations, stories that would be hard for us to, to believe and to stomach. And yes, so our time, our, at times, our situation might seem impossible, but that's the point. The point is that nobody, as a believer, actually has the ability to completely overcome sin on their own. It is impossible for us in the flesh. For man, it is impossible. That's why we need God, because for God, it is possible. We serve a God that raises the dead. We serve a God that brings sight to the blind. We serve a God that does the impossible. Amen? So we need to trust him. Trust that he can do the impossible in our lives, that he has the power to do the impossible and to save us from our own sinful nature. And I'll end with this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the verse that we know very well. If anyone comes to Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you so much, O oh God, for your word today. Uh, we're very grateful, O oh God, uh, for the understanding